when your client putatively commits a crime in front of you on the same phone call that you're on, your job is to you know, stop the call and tell him in a sidebar, sir, you can't say that, period, full stop. You just cannot ask for votes in Georgia. And yet Trump's attorneys did not do that. And in fact, they double pumped him and helped him along. That's misconduct and ought to be subject to bar review. I'm Quinta Jurassic, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, August 5th, 2022. Today, we're bringing you another episode of our Arbiters of Truth series on the online information ecosystem. A few weeks ago, we brought you a conversation with two emergency room doctors about their efforts to push back against members of their profession spreading falsehoods about the coronavirus. Today, we're going to take a look at another profession that's been struggling to counter lies and falsehoods within its ranks, the law. Recently, lawyers involved in efforts to overturn the 2020 election have faced professional discipline in a variety of forms. Like Rudy Giuliani, whose law license has been suspended temporarily in New York and D.C., while a New York ethics investigation remains ongoing. Paul Rosenzweig is a contributing editor at Lawfare and sits on the board of the 65 Project, an organization that seeks to hold accountable lawyers who worked to help Trump hold on to power in 2020, often by spreading lies. Paul has also spent many years working on issues related to legal ethics. So what avenues of discipline are available for lawyers who tell lies about elections? How does the legal discipline process work? And how effective can legal discipline be in reasserting the truth? It's the Lawfare Podcast, August 5th, when lawyers spread disinformation. One programming note before we begin. Evelyn Dueck, who's long been my fearless co-host on this series, will soon be beginning a new role as an assistant professor at Stanford University, and we'll be stepping back from this show. It's been a blast working with her, and we wish her the best. Keep an ear out for more on Lawfare's plans for Arbiters of Truth going forward. Paul, thank you so much for coming on. So you're on the board of this organization that's called the 65 Project. Tell me about it and what it's doing. Well, the 65 Project is named after the 65 lawsuits that President Trump and his supporters filed after the election, uh, all, all of which they effectively lost. Its mission is to call to account the attorneys who participated in that effort. Some of those suits were, well, they, none of them were meritorious, but some of them were not frivolous. Some of them were based upon realistic objections to certain counting methodologies, the absence or presence of observers in the uh, voting precincts, that sort of thing. But others of them were notably frivolous. I'm thinking mostly of uh, the ones that the public would know would be the lawsuits by uh, Sidney Powell unleashing the non-Kraken Kraken, Rudy Giuliani's uh, repeated misstatements of law and fact in front of of courts, the two non-starter original action suits brought in the the U.S. Supreme Court uh, by the states, which passed the border of frivolous. So attorneys are both zealous representatives of their clients, but they're also officers of the court. And, you know, as we'll talk about at greater length during the course of this podcast, that brings with it certain obligations of truthfulness, uh, lack of frivolity, obligations not to misrepresent the record, that sort of thing. Several of Trump's more well-known attorneys like Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani have been already disciplined or subject to disciplinary actions uh, by the bar's Uh, The bar is the organization that licenses lawyers, in case people don't know, by the bars where they held their licenses. And the 65 Project, to wrap it up, is an effort to go beyond the two or three most famous lawyers and call to account the other foot soldier lawyers who filed these suits frivolously, making representations that they knew were false, not ought to have known, but actually knew were false, that were not based upon representations that were legitimate. It's also uh, secondarily an effort to call to account 
uh, other lawyers who made misrepresentations not in lawsuits but through their participation in President Trump's fake elector scheme. Lawyers may not lend their name and or their uh, support to frauds on uh, the judicial or process but also on the legislative process and by filing false elector claims, some other attorneys seem to me to have violated the ethics rules. And then I guess the third uh, thing besides retrospective punishment is the idea that uh, if the bar doesn't self-regulate in this context, um, you know, its self-regulation will will have faded completely and won't be worth very much at all. And so it's an attempt uh, to revive or reinforce the uh, bar's self-regulating capacity with an eye not just towards the past, but towards the future as well. So there's a lot there. And before we, we dive into it more, um, I want to ask you to tell me a little bit more about your background in this area. You didn't just come to this after the 2020 election. You've been sort of working around this issue of legal discipline for a while. How did you get started? Well, I actually got started in the 1990s when uh, I was working for uh, Ken Starr. And one of the interesting little known sidelights was that uh, he was the subject of numerous uh, ethics complaints by Clinton partisans who were alleging his misconduct. Most of those were frivolous. A few of those were non-frivolous, but I, I thought in the end non-meritorious. But all of them required uh, an in-house ethics defense of some form or another. So I participated in um, helping Judge Starr uh, defend himself before the D.C. Bar Council, before the Department of Justice's Office of Professional Responsibility, which handles ethics complaints against federal prosecutors. And that interest kind of has continued for the last 23 years. Uh, I have served on uh, the District of Columbia Bar's Legal Ethics Committee, which writes advisory opinions to lawyers. Lawyers ask them, I've got this weird problem. What should I do when we write an opinion? And we, we're not necessarily right because we don't bind the courts. But if you follow our advice, you get a safe harbor of, of not being willful. Uh, I sat on the D.C. Bar's Rules Review Committee, which changes the ethics rules on a periodic cycle, updates them. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things there was uh, dealing with obligations of confidentiality in an electronic world, uh, since all the rules of confidentiality were written back at a time when uh, you had to lock your paper away uh, in a file cabinet, and that was considered adequate, not the same. Uh, I currently, I'm a hearing examiner for the District of Columbia Bar, which is their kind of in-house adjudicative function where we hear complaints against other uh, against lawyers who might have violated the D.C. Bar's rules. And I'm also on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia's Committee on uh, Admissions and Grievances, which does the same. And having mentioned both of those, I should absolutely hasten to completely add that anything I say today has no bearing on either of those two institutions, and they may well uh, disown me for what I say, but uh, it certainly means uh, that I'm not speaking for them. And frankly, uh, to the extent that I speak about stuff here, it means I wouldn't serve on any actual hearings in the District of Columbia that might come before us for reasons of interest and justified recusal. So you've you've been working in this space for a while then. I'm curious how you think the complaints and the disciplinary proceedings that we're seeing against lawyers who were involved in, let's just say, shenanigans generally around the 2020 election stack up to what you've seen in your work in this space. Are these sort of, you know, the, the legal profession, there are plenty of jokes about lawyers behaving unethically, uh, you know, a bit slippery. Is this within the realm of misconduct that you've seen in the past, or is this something new? This type of conduct is clearly in the minority uh, zone. The majority of complaints against attorneys are uh, things like he failed to follow up on my case and he missed a deadline, or um, he commingled my funds with somebody else's and took money that was he or she wasn't entitled to. More rare 
uh, he or she had a conflict of interest that they didn't adequately disclose and I was not made aware of them until after I lost. There was um, the uh, Judicial Watch guy. Um, Larry Clayman. Larry Clayman. He was recently just subject to discipline for a, for a conflict of interest matter. It is really rare in my experience for uh, lawyers to be subject to investigation and disbarment and sanction for conduct of the sort that uh, Rudy Giuliani was subject to, you know, affirmative misrepresentations in court. For one thing, not as you said, notwithstanding the jokes about lawyers, they don't actually tend to do that very often. For another, it often runs up against the obligation of zealous advocacy, which is kind of you know, the bar's equivalent of First Amendment advocacy. You're, you're supposed to go all the way up to the line in saying things on behalf of your client. And because we don't want to deter you from being zealous, that line, you know, you, you can get all the way up and maybe even a little over and not run into too much problem because of that. So these instances of outright fraud are rare. I should say that the only exception to that rule is that lawyers are often disbarred for fraud unrelated to their being a lawyer. You know, if I uh, lie to you and steal money from you in my personal capacity, I still lose my law license. So I'll say I first sort of got interested in this because uh, through the through the lens of misinformation, that there was a lot of discussion around 2020 and around the litigation after 2020 about, you know, how do we counter uh, falsehoods and lies about the election? And mostly that was focused on technology platforms like should Twitter, should Facebook be doing more to limit this kind of information? Um, and so it struck me as interesting when we also saw, you know, lawyers and professional associations and state bars kind of step in and say, we also think that we should be pushing back here and that there is a, a way to do so through these rules of professional conduct and other rules that sort of bind lawyers' conduct within the courtroom. So what do you think then about this possibility of using legal discipline as a way of countering misinformation and disinformation? Is this kind of a process that can be used to reassert truth in a sense? It's a process that can be used to reassert truth, but I think it operates in a relatively narrow context of the legal process itself, which is to say that you know, people know that Rudy Giuliani was disbarred, or some do, not, but not many do. And of those who do, almost none would probably know the details of exactly why he was disbarred and what falsities he told the court that resulted in his being subject to discipline. The same is likely true of Sidney Powell. We know she lied and we know she's getting disciplined. And that by itself is probably a good thing for reasserting the value of truth, but it doesn't establish what the truth is. It just establishes that there was falsity out there that was sanctionable. On that score, the legal ethics process is a good but not great vehicle for doing that. this. The first limit, as I've already kind of alluded to, is that it bumps up against this zealous advocacy idea that is at the core of, of representing a client. And so we expect lawyers to argue the facts in the way that is the closest and best way to justify their client's position, whatever that position might be. And that makes it difficult to use this process to police anything except the grossest and most extreme of falsehoods. And frankly, you know, the danger that I perceive to the integrity of the election or the perception of integrity of the election is a lot closer to those margins, right? I mean, yes, they can say that stuff was sent via satellite to an Italian manufacturer that resulted in 10 trillion votes being, you know, taken out of Dominion machines. But it's just the election was stolen. That's the problem, not the mechanics of, of it that are there. And, and as to that, the, you know, the 65 court cases probably did a better job than this will do. What I think the discipline process 
can do and should do better is both be a specific and a general deterrent to this conduct within the bar, specific in the sense of obviously of uh, punishing particular bad actors, having them lose their law license. You know, Rudy Giuliani will not do this again because he won't be allowed in court to represent anybody again, at least not until he gets his law license back. And that seems like it won't happen uh, during his lifetime. So, so that's a good specific deterrence. And then there's the general deterrence of uh, other lawyers who might be considering whether or not to participate in schemes of this nature, looking up and saying, you know, do I really want to go this way now that I know that the bars are actually being at least somewhat active in policing uh, the matter? So legal discipline is a complicated process. There are a lot of moving pieces. There are a lot of different authorities involved. It varies significantly state by state. So I don't want to ask you to give us an overview of how, you know, all 50 states and all the different jurisdictions go through this process. But using, you know, what, whatever example you're most familiar with, just give us a sense of, you know, how, how this works. Let's say, you know, an attorney is litigating before in the in DC courts um, and in federal courts in DC makes some frivolous false claim. What happens then? What's the pathway that leads us to potential discipline? So we're in DC federal court. The first thing to know is that DC federal court imports DC local bar rules. The licensing authority is the local bar, uh, DC in this case, or uh, California, I- Iowa. The federal courts uh, have discipline only over people who are practicing before them as opposed to people who get licenses because they're not licensing authorities. So if we were in D.C. federal court and an attorney made one of these egregiously false representations, and I'm going to assume as well that the attorney is also licensed in D.C., somebody would have to initiate the investigation by making a complaint. That could be opposing counsel. It could be uh, the attorney's client if the false representation, for example, wound up in the guy going to jail and getting convicted. It could be the district court judge in front of whom uh, the attorney appeared. That's, for example, what happened in Michigan to Sidney Powell, the district court judge, found her to have violated the ethics rules, and besides making her pay money to Detroit for the frivolous lawsuit, sent her name to the relevant bar authorities for further investigation. Once such a referral or complaint is made, it goes in D.C. to the Office of Bar Counsel, which is an investigative group of attorneys who conduct an investigation. Uh, They have plenary authority to do that investigation and compulsory authority over the attorney himself. It is an ethics violation to not cooperate with the ethics authorities. They can do whatever they feel is appropriate. Uh, For example, many complaints they take a quick look at, deem them frivolous, and get rid of them uh, without investigation. Others of them, where they've done a little bit of investigation, they will dismiss often with clearance through uh, a, a, an adjudicative authority, which I'll get to in a second. Or they can bring a complaint. If they bring a complaint, that brings it to the adjudicative authority, which in the District of Columbia is a, uh, a group of hearing examiners who are effectively administrative law judges. They will hear a complaint uh, in a panel, which in D.C. always includes at least one a non-lawyer citizen, because D.C. is committed to getting the perspective of our citizenry. And then that adjudicative body will make findings of fact and conclusions and recommend a sanction. The attorney can accept that sanction or, in rarer cases yet, appeal that sanction to the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, which is not the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia, the federal court, but the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, which is our local highest appellate court, who are the official 
adjudicators of bar discipline in, in, as a matter of final authority and the ultimate promulgators of the rules of professional conduct here in the District of Columbia. Ultimately, if that body you know, resolves a contested uh, proceeding, its decision is final. The punishment that we can mete out with respect to bar discipline is limited to bar-related stuff. You can be cautioned. You can be ordered to take remedial training. You can be suspended from the practice of law for a period of years, or your license can be permanently uh, revoked. And that's it. So one of the reasons that it's not such a great, uh, it's a useful disciplinary process, but it's not that punitive. uh, Because it's not that punitive, it doesn't have the same compulsory power as a civil suit for damages or you know, obviously a criminal suit where you wind up in the in jail for a term of years. There's also the the matter of what federal judges can do just with, within the courtroom. So we we talked about uh, this judge in the Eastern District of Michigan who disciplined Sidney Powell and her Kraken legal team, uh, in part by referring them to their respective state bars for discipline. And at least in Powell's case, that has translated into an investigation and ethics charges being brought by the Texas bar. That judge also fined Powell's team, as you said, a pretty hefty chunk of change, I think over $180,000. She told them that they had to uh, take some continuing legal education credits. Um, walk me through what that kind of discipline in, in a trial court, how that interacts with discipline by state bars, because I think uh, it's a complicated little question. Well, I mean, essentially, it's parallel. The two can happen... Uh, and one does not have preclusive effect on the other, one does not control the other. Obviously, one informs the other. And the fact that the judge has already done all of this kind of gives the Texas bar some sense of, of how at least one judge viewed the severity of what Powell did. The degree to which a judge may impose discipline is also partly dependent upon whether or not the contemptuous behavior occurred immediately in his or her presence, the judge's presence, or happened outside of the court. If it happened in the judge's presence, the judge has pretty plenary authority to run the gamut of of, of sanctions, you know, all the way up to and including at telling the marshal to 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 arrest the attorney and put him or her in jail for you know, a period of a few of some time until they purge themselves of the contempt. If the contempt happens outside of the judge's presence, then the judge has to typically go through some form of fact-finding process inside the courtroom that would justify whatever discipline he or she is thinking of imposing. And that may involve hearing from witnesses. It may involve ta- you know, reviewing papers. And it will certainly involve hearing argument. So you know, the summary, you know, go to jail now doesn't happen very, very often. And it usually is, is, is for something even worse than lying to the court. It's for disobeying a direct order. You know, sit down, stop making that argument. I got to do that. Off to jail. And that's exceedingly rare. And we, as far as I know, we didn't see any examples of that in no. the 2020 litigation. As far as I know, none. Uh, I have not studied all of them, so I hate to do the all, yeah, but I believe that that didn't happen. So we've kind of touched on this already, but I think it might be useful to dig with more specifics into what kinds of conduct we're talking about here in terms of the conduct implicated by 2020 election litigation and, you know, the giving advice of advice to Trump around overturning the election. Um, we've talked about the rules of professional conduct. What particular rules, what particular provisions do you see these lawyers as having potentially violated that could put them in in jeopardy before state bars? Well, there are, broadly speaking, two rules that that are applicable in this context. And I'm going to talk right now about the representations in court because the false electors are a slightly different group. But every state bar has rules of professional conduct or rules of professional responsibility, uh, one of which bars a lawyer from making 
knowing false representations to court. We are officers of the court, and we can't we can't tell the judge I served Quinta uh, with the papers when I haven't served Quinta with the papers. Judges are entitled to and do rely upon those representations all the time. It is improper and unethical for a lawyer to knowingly say something false. Now that, again, it's got to be knowing, so there's always that little out of I didn't know, uh, and it's got to be false as opposed to a matter of opinion. But, you know, if a lawyer says I have, you know, evidence, admissible evidence that 10,000 votes were transferred from one Dominion machine uh, on one Dominion machine from Trump to Biden, and he has no such evidence, nor does any such evidence exist, that's the type of misbehavior that can get a person in trouble. So that's a misrepresentation in court. A second set of rules bars lawyers from making frivolous claims, claims that they knew or ought to have known are frivolous. And that doesn't mean that I can't make a claim that I think is likely to lose if I have a good faith basis for thinking that there might be some way forward to win. It's the difference between arguing that the evidence should be suppressed, even though I know that I'm likely to lose that, which is something that defense attorneys do every day, uh, and arguing that the cop didn't get a warrant when I know in truth and in fact he got one. And I may argue it's defectiveness and I might be wrong and that would be stretching it, but, but it's the frivolous claim, the misrepresentation. So this is, this is kind of the claim that, for example, Texas has a right to intervene in Pennsylvania's adjudication of its electors. Which, can, can you give a little context about that? Because so for listeners who haven't followed this closely, ah. that, that is a claim that was made uh, right. by Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, who is now facing discipline, discipline in front of the For Texas making bar. that claim. States may sh- sue other states in the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. So there are lots of cases, New Jersey versus New York, over who owns Ellis Island sort of thing. As a proud New Jerseyan, I'll stick up for that. I'm a New Yorker and you're wrong. <laughs> but there you go. Um, we should ask Dr. Oz about that. I'm sorry. I had to, I had to go there. Uh, <laughs> I apologize to all Dr. Oz fans. But a Texas Attorney General, Ken Paxton, brought a suit or purported to seek to file a, an original action in the U.S. Supreme Court alleging that Pennsylvania's method of, of allocating its electors was flawed when there was no colorable claim of jurisdiction over that. The factual allegations had been rejected by five, I think, Pennsylvania courts already, state and federal. Uh, So it was the type of frivolous claim that was clearly just performative politics on his part and has wound him up in hot water for filing frivolous claims in front of the Texas state bar who are currently in the midst of, a, of an investigative proceeding that may or may not result in him losing his Texas state bar license. There's one other area of ethics rules that probably bears mentioning. The first two of those uh, apply when you're representing a client. So it was critical, it is critical, for example, to complaints about John Eastman that at the time he made uh, seemingly false claims about the Dominion machines, he was also representing Donald Trump in the Supreme Court, as was Ted Cruz, by the way, Uh, or at least so it seems. But beyond that, there's a catch-all rule, Rule 8.4, I think, that basically says lawyers should never engage in any fraud of any sort, even in their personal lives. And you know, we have a doctrine that you're, you're a lawyer full-time, 24-7. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that I can't tell my wife that she looks good in the dress when she doesn't. <laughs> Though, Katie, you always look good in the dress. But, uh, but it does mean that 
even outside of the practice of law, if I commit fraud in some other thing, you know, in buying a house or in stealing, uh, shoplifting, I have violated prohibitions against dishonesty, misrepresentation, and fraud and criminality that generally mean that I will be disbarred if convicted of a crime, even if the crime is unrelated to my legal practice and flipping it around, I can be disbarred from my legal practice if the bar concludes that I have committed or are likely to have committed a crime. And so when we talk about disciplining lawyers for, for you know, spreading falsehoods, how does that interact with the First Amendment? Uh, I know Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani have both pointed to the First Amendment in arguing that the state disciplinary proceedings against them in Texas and New York, respectively, are improper, essentially arguing that, you know, they're being penalized for expressing their political beliefs and that those beliefs are that the election was stolen. So what kind of constraints does the First Amendment put on this kind of discipline? And and why is it constitutionally acceptable for, you know, a state authority to discipline a lawyer for speech that might be protected for somebody else? Well, that's why the caveat of representing a client is critical. I do not believe that either of them would have been subject to any discipline at all had they spoken in a public setting of their belief that the election was stolen. Rudy Giuliani is not subject to dis- was not disbarred for what he said in front of the Four Seasons Landscaping Company. He was disbarred for what he said in court. And the courts have held against First Amendment challenges that lawyers' First Amendment rights with respect to what they say in court, and also, by the way, what with respect to what they say regarding their qualifications in lawyer advertising, though sounding in the First Amendment, may nonetheless be the basis of discipline. So in other words, you don't have the courts can impose gag rules in criminal cases. They can impose discipline for lying in court. Uh, and the First Amendment does not bar that. What it would bar, or what it is likely to bar, would be if Rudy Giuliani was subject to discipline for saying Donald Trump you know, won the election during the course of his speech at the Four Seasons. Though even there, it is the case that if there's an ongoing matter, a court may limit what the attorney can say outside of the courtroom. Uh, you can impose a gag order, as we do in all sorts of high-profile cases, rape cases, uh, p- politics cases, mafia cases, where the uh, attorneys are directed not to be able to go out and comment on the uh, proceedings that are happening at that moment. Uh, and that's not considered a First Amendment violation because it's in service of the uh, operation of the judicial system. So basically, Giuliani and Powell are making it up. And honestly, uh, both of them have lost every time they've raised that for exactly these reasons. So it's not just me saying it. It's every court that has looked at it. Right. And Powell, I think what you might be referencing is that Powell recently tried to get the Texas bar proceedings against her dismissed, and uh, the judge was not particularly interested. So I think you we've mentioned uh, Ted Cruz before. I think that Cruz's statements might be a, a good way to kind of explore the importance of this attorney-client relationship and advocacy in in whether or not something is open to bar discipline. So the 65 Project, of course, has filed an ethics complaint against Cruz, which points in large part to comments that he made um, on his podcast. I personally did not know that Ted Cruz has a podcast, but he does. Uh, he talked about the 2020 election on it. So what is it about Cruz's statements uh, on his podcast that you think, put his comments about the election into a space where bar discipline is appropriate? Well, a couple of things. The the first and most important is that he made them while he, he had said, I will represent Trump in the Supreme Court. I will argue the case for him. So it appears that an attorney-client relationship was created between Ted Cruz and Donald Trump uh, for 
the period of time from when he said he would do that until the time when the Supreme Court dismissed the case at a minimum and rendered moot the rep- or terminated the representation because the case to which it referred was was done. So it, it's, I think, critical to say that none of this is about uh, Ted Cruz talking on the on the floor of the Senate, and none of this is about Ted Cruz saying anything about any of this before or after his representation of Donald Trump. That having been said, when you're an attorney representing a client, you may not make statements that you know to be false statements of fact in support of your representation. And again, where it's the same thing we've talked about several times. You're allowed to zealously advocate. You're allowed to run up to the edge. But on his podcast, Cruz made several false, I mean, demonstrably false statements about the integrity of the election. He said that he thought that there was ample evidence that that, that votes had been stolen. He said that he thought there was ample, you know, significant evidence that Dominion was hacked, at none of which was true. And I would add that he did that after publicly saying that before he took the case, he reviewed the filings in some detail. So it wasn't that he was, he could say that he was repeating what somebody had told him, which would be lackadaisical on his part, but perhaps a, a defense. But he affirmatively publicly said, I've read it all, and I think that there's substantial evidence of fraud here. When, if he'd read it all, he would know that there was no such evidence of fraud. He would also have known that, you know, Trump was 0 for 65 in purporting to do that. So in some ways, I mean, in some ways I feel sorry for Cruz because he was probably just being a politician, doing what he could to burnish his credentials because he wants to be the next president of the United States. But in other ways, he's the worst actor of all because he has the biggest public microphone. He's an elected senator from the third largest state in the union, second largest now, I guess, um, you know, with presidential ambitions. And if he says stuff like that publicly in the context of representing Donald Trump, he's, you know, he's making that disinformation megaphone even louder. uh, And he's doing so with the authority of somebody who's expressly invoking his I am Trump's attorney and I've checked out the evidence expertise. And so you you said that, you know, it's important to keep in mind that part of this has to do with, uh, you know, putting forward knowingly false claims. It's not just that you you made an honest mistake. I think that gets to something interesting, though, and it gets to something that we've uh, talked about a lot in the context of January 6th, which is in the context of criminal culpability, which, to be clear, is a very different matter, uh, whether Donald Trump knew that the election, that he had really lost the election, or whether he'd convinced himself that he'd actually won, and and how that shapes our understanding of his criminal culpability. In this context, again, which is a, a very different context, how do we identify whether or not somebody knew that what they're saying is a lie? Like Sidney Powell, for example, could she argue, and I think she is, she has argued, uh, well, I think she's still arguing that the election was stolen, but, um, you know, she really believed that the election was stolen. How do you adjudicate that in this process? Well, I think you adjudicate it the same way. I mean, irrespective of the of the standards of proof and of the culpability at the end, you adjudicate somebody's knowledge and intent from their actions and from their words and you infer from that. So, you know, I'll play off of Trump a bit and say that, you know, everybody acknowledges that he is psychologically a really interesting and unusual and different case. And so there's at least a a scintilla of possibility that he genuinely believes that he won the election. In which case he's insane and should not be president. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that jokingly. If he genuinely believes a fact that isn't true, he shouldn't be president of the United States. But that would be a complete defense, I think, uh, if he had it. Uh, you know, insanity is a, is a le- legitimate uh, criminal defense, and and has been so for 250 years, uh, because we don't punish people criminally for that which they can't control. You know. The truth of the matter is, is that for 
people who don't present nearly that kind of edge mental case, the argument, no, I really did believe it, is, you know, mostly pretty laughable. I mean, you know, these are all uniformly lawyers, educated at the bar. Sidney Powell went to what? UNC Chapel Hill, right? You know, past the bar. You know, if 65 courts tell you that you're wrong, I don't believe you when you say, I genuinely still think I'm right. Because the evidence is such that that's not a credible statement of your actual state of mind. To be fair, I, I don't actually believe that about Trump either, as the January 6th evidence is, has you know, amplified how many people told him it was wrong and, and how, frankly, he seemed to have acknowledged it as well, as did Powell, right? Powell at one point said, well, you, know, uh, you shouldn't have taken my filings seriously. They were performative political theater. Right. right, and this is this is in uh, her defense against a defamation case filed, I believe, by Dominion. Exactly. I, yo, know, you shouldn't take it seriously that I meant it. To which the answer is, we're in court. You only do things that you mean here in court, right? If she made that defense out, yeah, you know, what she said to you know a, a rally, yeah, you know, it might fly. But you don't get to do that in court anymore. Uh, I mean, and that that kind of is the is the backside of this which is that lawyers representing clients in proceedings already are under an affirmative obligation to be sure that what they're saying is true. So that superimposed upon the extensive evidence that what they're saying is not true negates pretty strongly any legitimacy in the argument, no, I really, I really thought that we won the election. And this gets to something that I think is was notable, honestly, throughout the Trump era in terms of the role of courts that you would see President Trump when he was in office making these sort of big, wild statements about things. And then his lawyers would show up in court and would be forced to make a very much constrained <laughs> version of that same argument because the courtroom is a space where you can be disciplined if you if you speak falsely. And to some extent, we I think we did see this in the 2020 election litigation where, you know, Rudy would go out there and make these big, wild claims and then would say, I'm not really alleging any fraud. Exactly, here. exactly. Which is one of the things that's <laughs> that has got him in hot water before yeah. before bar authorities. I mean, keeping in mind what you said before about the fact that this is, you know, insofar as legal discipline is able to kind of push back against falsehood, it can only do so in a very, very limited way. Is it fair to see the courtroom as a kind of space of truth in a political environment that has been uniquely overrun by falsehood right now? Or is that too, you know, pie in the sky, rose colored glasses? I would say that it is, to a limited degree, a space of, of truth. I mean, that, after all, is what the adjudicative process is about. We think that the rules help us get closer to the truth, imperfectly, to be sure. I think that, to some degree, uh, Trump tried to bums rush the courts as well as, his, as, well as he bummed rushed the uh, executive branch, the legislative branch, and the public. And of the four of those... The courts proved the most resistant during the Trump era. Uh, one thinks, for example, of the Census Bureau decision uh, in which the court, though only barely, rejected the transparently false justifications offered by the Census Bureau for, the, for imposing a citizenship question in the, in the census. You know, so the courts held the line more than many. And certainly in the election itself, they did an excellent job. And that was across the ideological spectrum of judges and justices. It was, it, it was comforting. The courts are imperfect and their ideological biases are real. But it was comforting to see that uniformity in the rejection of President Trump's absurdities. How do you think disciplinary authorities have been doing so far? Um, obviously, the Sixth Amendment Project is formed in part to kind of push for discipline on a group of lawyers who haven't faced it 
so far. Do you think that authorities have been insufficiently aggressive? Bar authorities are traditionally not very aggressive. Um, There's almost no self-started cases uh, across the country. They always come on complaints. Um, So they are inherently reactive rather than proactive. And that's, that's a history that goes back years and years and years, and it's not related to January 20th at all, uh, which is one of the reasons that the 65 Project wanted to kind of goose them along. They are also historically extremely slow methods, encrusted with procedural rules, but also very careful, uh, very reluctant to, to, to act, very reluctant to step into political matters. Most of the Ken Starr matters were rejected on the, you know, we're not going to get between the independent council and the president ground, which isn't really a legal ground for rejecting taking disciplinary action, but it's a reality Um, because they're really, you know, pretty far down on the totem pole of of adjudicative authority and punitive authority. So they, they know their place in the world and it's not at the, they're not the apex predator, (laughs) if you will. I would say that so far, they're doing pretty okay. You know, Giuliani has been disbarred uh, or suspended, I guess. He hasn't been fully disbarred yet. Powell is facing at least two active investigations, I think. Jeffrey Clark has an active investigation open against him. So does John Eastman. Eastman and Clark are, and Giuliani are likely to face much more severe problems than the disciplinary process. And I should add, by the way, that often disciplinary processes wait because they don't want to interfere with those things that are higher up in the process. So, for example, hypothetically, were John Eastman to ever be indicted, the uh, disciplinary investigation of him in California would uh, be suspended almost immediately uh, because it, they would nobody would want to conflict with with that. And so so that's another fill-up to it. I am hopeful that the disciplinary process takes up the mantle of adjudicating complaints against the less famous foot soldiers in this. Um, people like Cleta Mitchell, for example, uh, people like the fake electors in Georgia, whose active participation was actually essential to helping Uh, Trump fight uh, his loss and who ought not to have done what they did, just ought not to have done what they did. When your client putatively commits a crime in front of you on the same phone call that you're on, your job is to, you know, stop the call and tell him in a sidebar, sir, you can't say that, period, full stop. You just cannot ask for votes in Georgia. And yet Trump's attorneys did not do that. In fact, they double pumped him and helped him along. That's misconduct and ought to be subject to bar review. So for for people who are interested in keeping an eye on this going forward, what would you suggest they look out for? You know, what are there particular signs that would suggest that uh, disciplinary authorities aren't being aggressive enough. What what should they look for to indicate that you know investigations are going forward in the way perhaps that that you would want? Given that so many of these procedures are, of course, confidential while they're ongoing. Yeah, it, it's hard to keep track of them because, in fact, they are confidential. the The public milestones that happen most frequently are the opening of an investigation is often publicly acknowledged. The filing of a complaint, which is the you know, prosecutorial equivalent of an indictment in this case, is typically a public step. So, for example, an investigation is ongoing, but no complaint has been filed against John Eastman in California. That would be something to note. Thereafter, there would be an adjudicative decision. That, too, would be public at some point. And that would be an item of note. So each of these is somewhere along the way from start to finish, the milestones being opening investigation, formal complaint, adjudication of responsibility, and termination of the case and imposition of discipline. Those would be the the four highlights. So for example, you know, just last week, the Ethics Bar Council in DC filed a formal complaint against Jeffrey 
Clark. So that will now go to adjudication in front of the hearing examiner's board, of which I'm a member. Uh, I should add, by the way, that both because I've spoken about it here and because I know Jeff Clark, if asked to sit on it, I would not participate. So I'm free to at least note that without prejudging it in any way. All right. Let's leave it there. Paul, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to Arbiters of Truth, the Lawfare podcast series on our online information ecosystem. You can find past episodes in the Lawfare podcast feed, as well as our separate Arbiters of Truth podcast feed. The Lawfare podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. You can get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts by becoming a Lawfare material supporter at patreon.com backslash lawfare, where you'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. This podcast was edited by Jen Pacha Howell, and our audio engineer this episode was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thanks for listening. <laughs>